Good morning, everyone. Uh, our apologies. Uh, technology is a wonderful thing when it works, and when it doesn't, uh, as many of you well know, it can be maddening. And this morning we've had a little bit of technical difficulties, and so we've switched from the camera that we normally use to uh, live streaming from, from our phone again. But hopefully you can hear as well as see me now and uh, participate in our worship. Uh, for those of you who may be uh, catching us for the first time, my name is Dale Rains. I'm pastor here at the St. John United Church of Christ in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, located in the New Lou neighborhood of Louisville, just east of downtown. And we are so glad to have you worship with us, whether you are worshiping with us live on Sunday morning, August the 2nd, or uh, catching this service sometime later on Sunday afternoon or sometime during the week. Whenever that works for you, we're glad that you're worshiping with us. As uh, I always do, I want to encourage you, if you have not already gathered what you need, uh, to take time because uh, we're going to be sharing in a time of Holy Communion as part of our worship later on. And so if you don't have those elements at hand, I encourage you to take a moment and go to your kitchen wherever you need to go to grab some bread or crackers, uh, juice, uh, wine, water, whatever you have, uh, so that you can participate in that act of worship with us and, and have that sense of truly being connected and being part of the body of Christ. Uh, one other word that I want to share uh, with you is since we've had to um, make some changes here uh, as far as equipment this morning, uh, there is music that was going to be uh, within uh, the worship time that I'll be sharing with you, and we're not going to be able to do that as planned this morning, but it will be posted uh, later after, uh, after I've concluded. And so I encourage you to to take time to, to listen to a, a beautiful solo of What Wondrous Love Is This uh, by our own Dane Waters. Well, as we, as we enter into a time of worship together, I invite you to, to hear these words and be drawn into an attitude of worship. The day breaks and God does not let us go. The hour calls, and God does not let us go. The evening falls, and God holds us fast. So let us turn to God in worship. Let us turn to God, who never turns from us. Let's pray. Holy God, we come to you this day in the midst of times that in so many ways feels chaotic. We are pulled in many directions, distracted by so many things. In this moment, open our hearts to receive you. Deliver us from the temptation to just give up and flounder in the rough waters of life. Reach out to us, Holy One, with your strength and power, and bring us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes again from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, and a very familiar story to, to many. It says, now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And so when he went ashore, a great, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. 
They replied, we have nothing here but these five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled. They took up what was left over, the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. This is the gospel of Christ. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Holy God, thank you for for the scriptures that open our eyes and our minds to more of who you are so that we might understand more of your love for us. In these moments, God, speak to us by your Spirit. Give us not just ears, but minds and hearts that are open to hear. Thank you. In Christ's name. That story that I just read is certainly one of the, the most well-known of all the miracle stories involving Jesus. It's right there with his raising of Lazarus from, from the dead and, and turning water into wine. But I have a hunch that this one is at least as well-known as those, maybe even more so. It's referred to most often as the feeding of the 5,000. But that title really is a vestige of patriarchy. The text itself says that there were about 5,000 men besides women and children. In the world I live in, women and children are people too. And so certainly way more than 5,000 people ate that evening. The story is well known, but it's also much debated. People have debated the details of this story probably since it was first told and most certainly since it was first written down. But I think that debating the details distracts us from what should perhaps be the most important point of the whole story. A man named Simon Sinek, a few years ago, gave a TED Talk and also wrote a book, both of which were entitled, Start With Why. I haven't read the book, but I, I have watched the TED Talk several times. It has a message that can be applied in many settings, and it's less than 20 minutes in length, so it's easily used. In fact, I've used it on a couple of occasions with our church council. Cynic looks at the question of why certain people and organizations or companies are successful while others that are as well or better equipped, as well or better funded, don't. One of the examples that he uses is Apple. He points out that as a company, Apple does the same thing as a number of other companies. He notes that, that there are some other companies that also made quality products but have not succeeded at the same level, and some that have not even survived. The difference, Cynic says, is based on what he calls the golden circle. Now, when in the TED Talk he draws that on a, on a pad, it actually looks more like a target. 
In the outer ring of that circle or target, he writes the word what. And on the middle ring, he writes the word how. And in the center, he writes the word why. He hypothesizes that all companies and organizations know what they do and they know how they do it. But he says that few give a compelling reason as to why. Sinek says that if Apple operated like most of those other companies, a marketing pitch from them might go something like this. We make great computers. They are beautifully designed and user-friendly. Want to buy one? You see, in, in that, they're, they're saying what they do. They're saying how they do it, making them beautifully designed and user-friendly, but they don't say why. And he says that that's how most of us communicate, and it's how most marketing is done. But he says that the way Apple actually communicates is by saying, everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we do that is by making our products beautifully designed and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? He says that, that they and and a few others, reverse the order of that circle. And instead of starting with what they do, they start with why. I think we need to do that with this story involving Jesus from, from Matthew's Gospel. Too often when we think about this story, we get sidetracked by the other two outer rings of cynics circle. We get distracted by the what, get caught up in the details of, of feeding that many people. Where were they that they were that far away from places to, to get food? And, and the baskets of leftover, first of all, where did they come up with the baskets if they were in such a remote place? And, and what did they do with all those leftovers anyway? We get distracted by the what. And we really get distracted by the why. Or by the how, I'm sorry. How did this happen? Did Jesus somehow miraculously make more fish and bread out of that one boy's lunch? And if so, exactly at what point in the story did that happen? Did it happen as he prayed, giving thanks for it and, and blessing it, or as he handed it to the disciples to distribute, how, how did that happen? Or did a lot of people, when they saw the boy give what he had, suddenly remember that, hey, they've had some food with them too, and so they shared it, and and there was enough for everyone, which, by the way, is no less miraculous to get that many people to share on that level. How did it happen? We get distracted by that. But I think a lot more of our focus should be on the why. And that requires us to bypass the questions of what and how. Set those aside and start with why. Why did Jesus do what he did? Well, to, to discover that, we have to back up in the text a bit. Really, before the issue of food ever comes up. At the beginning of the passage that we read, it it says, now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there. Well, heard what? Well, what he had just heard 
was about the execution of his cousin, his friend, John the Baptist, by Herod. And so surely, upon hearing that news, he was feeling a lot of grief, among other things. And the text tells us that because of that, he, he withdrew. He went by boat somewhere remote, looking for some quiet time, some time to, to grieve, some time to be alone. But somehow the people found out where he was going and they followed on foot, but they got there before he did. And so they were there already waiting when he stepped off the boat. And it's what's in the text next that answers our why question. It says that when he got there, he, he got off the boat, and it says he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them. Jesus was tired, not just physically tired, but weary. We've all felt that at, at times, just a weariness of spirit. He was grieving. Who knows what other emotions he was experiencing. And so we would have understood that if, when he got off the boat and saw that crowd, that he didn't wouldn't have said a thing and just turned around and got back on the boat and went somewhere else. Or we'd have understood if he'd have walked up and spoken to the crowd and said, you know, folks, look, I, I'm really sorry, but I just need some time. I, I don't have it in me to, to give anything. I don't have anything for you right now. And if he had just sent them away. But he did neither of those things. He saw them. He really saw them. And he had, the text tells us, compassion for them. That's why he spent time with them. That's why he healed the sick among them. And that's why he made sure they didn't go hungry. Too often these days, we aren't looking behind people's actions or their motivation. We aren't looking to answer the why question. I confess that I find myself getting very, very frustrated looking at social media these days. I see people complaining about steps that the governor has taken, restrictions on, on businesses, the, the mask mandate, choosing not to believe or just to not listen to the reasons why these things are being done in order to stop the spread of this virus, which, if that is accomplished, will save lives and, by the way, in the long run, save businesses. I see people on social media accusing the Black Lives Matter organization of all kinds of atrocities and equating protesters with lawless anarchists. Again, choosing not to believe or at least not to listen to why there is a Black Lives Matter movement in the first place or why people are peacefully and persistently protesting across the country, which is 
because of generations of actions. Actions individual, societal, and systemic that have devalued the lives of black people. Actions that continue to this day. That's why people are protesting. But let's think about church and our why question. Why church? Why are we here? What is it that moves us? Jesus was moved in this story that we read by his compassion. What moves us? Well, some might say that in answering the why question that we are here to hold worship services, to give people an opportunity to worship together, but also to baptize people and to marry people and to, to bury people, comfort the grief. But I think those are the wrong answers. Those things are what we do, not why. And it's not even a complete answer in terms of answering what we do. The why, you see, is, is much deeper than just the what. You see, in answering the why question, we have to get to that the church is here because we believe that God calls us to be agents of transformation in the world, to usher in the kingdom of God, to usher in that kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of love, the kingdom of, of shalom, peace and completeness. Now that means that it's incumbent upon us to do the how also. And this is all part of, of the why as well. That means that as just as Jesus got off that boat and saw the crowds and had compassion for them, that means that we need to look out at the world, see the crowds, and have compassion for them, and to be moved by that compassion, moved to action, just as Jesus' compassion moved him. And that means not looking away when we see suffering. That means not looking away when we see injustice. It means acting on that compassion even when it costs us something. Even when it costs us a lot. This past Thursday, the funeral was held for Congressman and civil rights icon, John Lewis. I listened to the funeral here in my office at church as I was working on Thursday. On that day, on Thursday, the New York Times published an op-ed, a letter to America that was written by Congressman Lewis just days before he died. In that letter, he said, Emmett Till was my George Floyd. He was my Rayshard Brooks, Sandra Bland, and Breonna Taylor. He was 14 when he was killed, and I was only 15 years old at that time. I will never ever forget the moment when it became so clear that he could have easily been me. In those days, fear constrained us like an imaginary prison. 
and troubling thoughts of potential brutality committed for no understandable reason were the bars. And now with that in mind, hear what he went on to say later in that letter. He said, in my life I have done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence is the more excellent way. John Lewis was moved by his faith. He was moved by love and peace. Friends, Christ was the compassion of God incarnate. Compassion for you and for me. May we be moved by the love of God within us to follow that way of peace and love just as John Lewis was. May we do our part to transform the world, our part to build the beloved community, our part to usher in God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Well, this morning for our prayer time, I want to do something that I've done in the past in these services, but not for a while, and that is to kind of lead us in a time of guided prayer. Not so much of me praying and you listening, but me prompting you, helping you to think and to kind of guide you on a path of, of prayer. And so I will do that giving some time of silence, some space for you to offer up the prayers of your heart. And we do that in full confidence and faith that God hears each and every prayer. And so let's pray. Holy One, in the midst of our fear and our uncertainty, we discover that you are with us. You have compassion for us. And so we know that when we are feeling alone and anxious, you're right here with us. Help us to turn to you in these moments. God, we pray today for our friends, family, and others in our circle of acquaintance who are sick or who have other acute needs. Christ, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray today, O oh God, for those who are struggling financially. Christ, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray today, O oh God, for health care professionals and all those working in our hospitals. Give them strength. Keep them safe.
Christ in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray today, God, for educators preparing for a new school year in the midst of so much uncertainty. We pray for students and for their parents who are also living into that uncertainty. Christ, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray today, God, for the decision makers in our community, in our state, and in our country. Christ, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray today for ourselves, acknowledging our own frailty, our own weakness. Christ, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we are in a time that even after several months still feels so foreign and so unfamiliar. We long for a stability, for a safe harbor in the storm. Help us to find that in our relationships with one another Help us to find that in the beauty that is yet now all around us. Most of all, dear Lord, help us to find it in you, our rock and our redeemer. In the holy name of Christ, who taught us to pray. O God, our mother, our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, for Holy Communion this morning, I invite you to lend Christ your table or whatever you are using as a table this morning, even if it's your lap. Lend Christ your table, your bread, your cup, most of all your heart. Come, you weary and restless, all who hunger and thirst, Jesus calls us to dine as friends. Come, for God's feast awaits us. As we receive this bread and this fruit of the vine, we honor both creator and creation. As we bless and share these gifts, we celebrate the table fellowship of Jesus, where all are worthy and all are welcome. As we receive the fruits of the Spirit, we celebrate the communion of all things. Creator, Christ, and Spirit dance as one. So may it always be. Let's pray. Come, Holy One, come. Bless this meal. Bless this fellowship. Bless our lives. That justice and love may be the measure of our common witness. Amen.
through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. Through the cup, we participate in the new life that Christ gives. Lord Jesus Christ, you have nourished us in this meal, fed our bodies and our souls. We have heard your love, so send us forth to speak it. We have seen your love, so send us forth to show it. And we have been fed on your love, so send us forth to share it. And let all things be done for your glory. Amen. It has been good to share in a time of worship with you this morning. Before we end our time, let me just remind you of a few things for those who would like to financially support the ministry that God has for us here at St. John. We invite you to do so. You can mail a check to our church mailing address or uh, you can also find us on Venmo and give to us electronically through that app on your smartphone. We deeply appreciate all those who have been faithfully supporting uh, the church through this this strange and, and different time in which we are living. Uh, a couple of other things coming up. Uh, this Tuesday night is our monthly libations and conversations gathering, uh, which in other times would take place at a local uh, establishment where we would share food and, and uh, the beverage of your choice. But in this time, we are, like so many others, utilizing the Zoom platform. And so if you would like to, to be a part of that, uh, you are invited to, to just send the church office an email by noon on Tuesday, and uh, we will send you a link uh, for that, that Zoom gathering. And uh, the, the beverage, as always, and the food also is up to you. Uh, but it will be a time of, of connection and conversation. And those are things we all need in these, in these days. Another thing that is beginning this week, our local UCC churches are uh, doing an online, hosting an online uh, course uh, entitled God Loves Racial Justice. Uh, it will be taught, will be led uh, by Dr. Tyler Mayfield, who is professor of Old Testament at Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. And it will take place each Thursday evening in the month of August, beginning this coming Thursday. Um, and I should know this off the top of my head. I believe the times for that are from 7 to 8.30 uh, each week. Uh, if you would like to participate in that, again, please email our church office and we'll send a Zoom link to you. We do need to know ahead of time uh, so that we can let Dr. Mayfield know how many to expect. But, uh, and we need to know ahead of time so we can get you that link so that you can participate. But, that looks to be a wonderful opportunity uh, and beneficial to us all, again, and very timely uh, with what is going on in our country. And so even in these times when we cannot come together physically in this beautiful space where I sit right now, we are still the church, and there is still work to be done, and we still are in relationship and in connection with each other and with our community. Those are things we, we need to remind ourselves of frequently uh, so that we not get discouraged for one thing, but also so that we remain faithful in doing and being all that God has called us to do and to be. And so as we end this time together, I say to you, may God's peace 
carry, keep, and hold you. May God's love nourish, bless, and enfold you. May God's Spirit inspire, lift, and mold you. Almighty God, triune, holy, and blessed be with you now and forevermore. Go and be the church. In the name of God, Creator Christ and Holy Spirit.